So today, this morning and this afternoon, uh, I'm going to present my work uh, for my PhD at the University of Glasgow. So it's a PhD I finished in 2019, and I worked on this project between 2014 and 2019. Uh, I show here three images that illustrate the main components of, uh, of my research. The first one is uh, using historical estate maps as a primary source of data. Uh, integration of this data into a GIS, Geographic Information System, uh, to reconstruct with uncover and to characterize the changes also over time. And the last bit over there is uh, how we can relate the findings, uh, reconstructions with the uh, ecology of the woodland as it is today. How we can put the ecology of uh, woodland into the historical context. So for my research, I used about uh, 350 uh, estate maps uh, from private collections and public collections. Uh, thanks to DAMP, the NLS, the NRS, and the uh, universities uh, who, who shared the, the maps with me. Uh, they are maps that can cover uh, one small farm, sometimes several farms, sometimes one parish. Uh, they all show the woodland uh, cover with a very, uh, very high accuracy. And in many cases, there is also this uh, content uh, table uh, already uh, presented by, uh, by uh, Chris and Archie that provide additional information about uh, whether this woodland is a plantation, whether it is a wood pasture, or what type of management uh, were happening in, the, in these woods. So what I should say is that uh, Chris already mentioned it, but some of these maps are very small, they're the size of a book, and some of those maps are very, very large. They can be uh, up to 1 meter 80, 1 meter 90 uh, large. So we all work on a very large variety of, uh, of documents. So why are estate maps unique? I think you already have a feel of it. Uh, these four maps cover the same area, which is uh, Elioch Estate in the uh, parish of Sankar. You will recognize here the Royal Military Survey of Scotland, uh, the county maps, the estate plan, which is by uh, Hamilton Leslie. Uh, Archie already uh, showed this map uh, earlier. And the first OS, uh, OS map. Uh, of course, what you can see here is that in terms of uh, depiction of the boundaries of the woodland, the estate maps is uh, very unique, much, much more accurate uh, than the Royal Military Survey of Scotland and the county map, also because the scale uh, make it uh, possible to, to directly compare this map with the first edition uh, OS map. So if we put together all, this, all these estate maps, uh, we can really have an insight about how the woodland cover looked like uh, before the 1860. And it's actually a unique source of information because uh, we don't have any direct evidence of uh, woodland cover before the first urban survey. So that's why these maps are very valuable. And also, as I mentioned earlier, they provide information about what is plantation or what type of management uh, uh, for the woodlands. So my PhD was divided in, in three uh, main aims. The first one was uh, reconstructing the historical woodland cover at different time periods. Uh, the second one was to characterize the changes in the, in the long term and uh, also identifying the driving forces, the actors, the reasons why uh, the woodland cover has changed uh, over time. And uh, the very last uh, aspect, which I will discuss part of this morning and also this afternoon, is uh, how we can relate this uh, with the ecology of the woodland as it is today with a special focus on uh, ancient woodland and an assessment of the ancient woodland inventory uh, in Scotland. But I will first start with the first uh, objective, which is reconstructing the woodland cover. Uh, it means basically creating, uh, implementing a GIS method to uh, integrate the information from historical maps into, uh, into a GIS and also assessing the uncertainties, uh, uncertainties that are associated with, uh, with this process. So Chris already uh, showed about uh, georeferencing. So it's a process of being able to overlay historical maps into uh, modern reference layers. So putting all these documents into uh, the same uh, reference system, geographic reference systems. So the reference layers are uh, satellite imagery, OS master maps, uh, first edition OS maps are uh, already available uh, georeferenced by uh, the NLS. And in my PhD, I uh, integrated the asset maps as uh, additional layers. I divided them in two, uh, two time series. The first time series for the map 1740, 1799, and the second time series for maps, estate maps 1801, 1833. 
And they are all directly comparable with this uh, time series, which is the uh, first uh, edition OS. The reason why I separated 18th and 19th century is because uh, most of the maps of the 18th century were before enclosure, before agricultural improvement. And most of the maps of the 19th century, early 19th century, are after this uh, improvement. So it makes them di directly uh, comparable. I haven't had your reference the OIS maps, but I will use this uh, to compare uh, the results, mostly for this first time series, um, which is uh, important mostly for the ancient woodland inventory, as I will explain it uh, later. Um, in practice, I'm not going to go uh, to get into the detail of it, but uh, to your reference an historical map, we are trying to find features uh, on the map that have remained stable until today to put into correspondence uh, these historical maps on top of the modern reference system. So that's what we, we call control points. Uh, the second step is what we call a transformation. There are different method, mathematical methods to transform. I really went with the most simple one, which is rotation and rescaling. So I wanted to keep the special information by the surveyors as uh, close as the original as possible. I didn't want to create any artificial deformation to, to force uh, this map to overlay on the modern reference. In some cases, I use what we call affine transformation, which just allows some stretching, and it can help, for instance, to compensate if the, if the map has had some alteration over time. It can have shrinked a little bit or stretched a little bit, and this affine transformation can help to, to compensate this alteration of, um, of the historical maps. Uh, the next step is vectorizing the woodland. So it's how we integrate the data, uh, we capture the data into a geographic information system. Uh, it's not only redrawing the woodland, it's uh, also integrating in the database all the information we have about this woodland, uh, such as the management uh, when, it's, uh, when it's available. Uh, I put here an example of how the vectors overlay today on the 1804 map. And uh, as you can see, it's, uh, it overlays quite well. It's not an exception, I don't pick uh, specifically uh, the best map to show you to, that it works, but in most cases, the accuracy, uh, what we call the planimetric accuracy of this map, is the, are, are very good. Uh, it goes from uh, five meters, 10 meters, up to 20 meters from truth, which for a woodland cover reconstruction can be considered as, uh, as enough. Uh, and of course, this uh, was repeated uh, many, many times, so it's uh, quite some work. Uh, in some cases, for instance, uh, this map from uh, James Wells uh, covers Barony of Lochhutten and covers quite a large area. And I don't know if because James Wells made a mistake uh, sometime, at some point in his uh, survey, or if it's because of the map that was not particularly flat, but uh, it was not easy to reference the whole area at once. So what I did is I just uh, de reference individually subsets of these historical maps that I used afterwards to capture the woodland cover. So it's uh, also another step that could uh, be used uh, in case uh, there are issues with uh, map referencing. Um, here I'm showing basically the coverage uh, of the study area, so Nisdale and Annandale, uh, using 352 uh, estate maps, covering about 1.5% uh, of Scotland. Uh, in orange here are the area for which we have estate maps from the 18th century and early 19th century. So we have like a full time series. Uh, in red, there are the maps for which we only have 90, early 19th century uh, maps. And uh, in yellow, there are the areas for which we only have uh, second half of the 18th century. But in any case, it's always possible to compare those maps with the first urban survey that covers the whole Scotland and with, uh, of course, the map of today. About the results, uh, it's an example here about Drumland Rig Estate. So to do this reconstruction, I use 140 estate maps, uh, about. And for this one, three estate maps covering a very large, uh, large area by uh, William Crawford. And as we can see, uh, there is a very sharp increase in the woodland cover over time, uh, from 1772 up to the early 19th century, to the mid 19th century, and up to today. And this uh, is consistent across all the study area. So if we look at uh, Dyle Swinston, that is a little bit south from uh, Drumland, Drumland Rig, we again observe exactly the same trend uh, with a lot of uh, woodland here uh, mentioned as plantation by, uh, by William Crawford. 
uh, and even more plantation uh, in the early 19th century. For the story, this one was written uh, intended for planting and never appeared afterwards, so I think it was never planted in the end. Uh, and Annandale Estates, uh, it's about the same. So here I lumped together historical estate maps, 1780, uh, 1815 together. And we, we see uh, a lot of, uh, of plantations of, uh, of woodland everywhere, which account for about 50% of the, of the woodland cover uh, in the end. So it's possible, thanks to the GIS, to quantify these changes over time. Uh, area one is the one I showed you earlier in orange, and you can see how the woodland cover has increased over time from 3% to 4.6, 8.3, 15 uh, today, uh, 2014. Uh, again, the same trend was, uh, was found in area two, for which we didn't have uh, estate maps at uh, this time in the series, but uh, we can see uh, how it has increased, and uh, the same for uh, the third area. So the next step was to characterize these changes. Now we know we were able to reconstruct the woodland cover at different time series, but we want to see where the woodlands appear, where they disappeared, and, uh, and try to see how it worked about the woodland cover as it is, uh, as it is today. So an example of uh, application is what we call uh, change detection analysis. Here I compare the uh, estate maps, woodland reconstruction from uh, 19th, uh, 18th century with the first ordnance survey. And we can see everywhere the woods were new, where they were extant in blue, and where they were lost. Because earlier I mentioned about an increase of the woodland cover over time, but there is not only an increase locally, we obviously lost some woodland there and there. So it's interesting because we can see how progressively uh, the woodland cover today has been shaped by all these uh, changes. And again, as mentioned earlier, we can, we can quantify uh, these changes using uh, GIS. Uh, if I look at the 18th century woodlands, so based on this reconstruction, uh, we can see that between the uh, 18th century and the uh, mid uh, 19th century, first unknown survey, 60% of the woodlands survived and 40% uh, were lost. This 60% that survived, 40% of them survived in 2014, and 26% are broadleaved and 23% are coniferous. Which is interesting is that we can see indeed, uh, we can follow the fate of these woodlands. I can do the same with the woodlands from the 19th century. And what is interesting to notice is that this uh, woodland, this, uh, there are more woodlands disappearing between this period and this period than between this period and this period, which is not always what we can read in the literature. But it's what we see in our study area. Um, one of the limitations of the estate maps is uh, very often they don't say much, say much about uh, what type of tree species uh, you see on the map. It's, a, it's an important limitation, but we have a lot of historical sources that we can add uh, to this to get the new insight to, to complement uh, the insight of, uh, of the estate maps. The old statistical account and new statistical account uh, confirms that there are a lot of plantations over time. It's absolutely consistent, again, across all study area. I looked at this uh, account for each of the parishes that were covered by the woodland cover reconstruction. And in addition, we can have a feel of what type of species were, uh, were planted and also what are the reasons why this, uh, these plantations uh, occurred over time. So I put two, uh, two quotes from uh, different uh, historical sources here. In some cases, but it was already mentioned by, uh, by Archie, uh, we can make the distinction between broadleaf and coniferous on estate maps. Like here, for instance, uh, William Crawford show uh, broadleaf uh, trees. And here there is a belt of uh, coniferous woodland. Uh, there is a forester called Montis in 1825, about the 1823, is that uh, correct, Archie? About the same time period. Uh, explaining why it, will be, it was interesting to plant a belt of uh, coniferous trees uh, around broadleaf to protect them from the wind uh, as, as a nursery. Um, again, Crawford uh, shows here uh, some uh, woodlands that are broadleaf, made the distinction which, with uh, coniferous. And what is interesting is that if I compare these boundaries with uh, maps by James Leslie covering the same area 50 years before, it's absolutely consistent. We can really follow uh, the evolution of the, of the woodland cover. And we can see that some of these uh, plantations were not on Leslie, but some of this woodland were already on the James Leslie 50 uh, years earlier with very similar boundaries. 
Uh, the first London survey also can provide information uh, about this. We have the 25 inch to the mile and the 6 inch to the mile, and the 25 inch to the mile make a distinction within the same wood about uh, different stands. Some are mixed woodlands, some will be uh, coniferous and will be broadleafed. So, then, unfortunately, the 25 inch to the, mile, to the mile don't cover the whole study area, but in, where they cover the study area, uh, I basically uh, vectorize the woodland, capture the information about the woodland type, and we found, for instance, that about 68% of the woodland by 1860 in drumland rig estates are uh, mixed woodland. So it's a slightly different story than what I tend to read, what we read about uh, the woodland cover in Scotland. So here I put uh, from different sources what uh, I could read, about 9% of the woodland cover during the early 19th century. Uh, in my study area, I found about 5%, and already 20% of them uh, were late 18th century plantations, showing that plantations occur already very early. We have instances of plantation from uh, 1759, and even, even slightly before, in the study area. And so it was obviously quite a common, and we have this example of Annandale Estate, showing a lot of plantations too. Uh, I often read that there are not much variation over the 19th century, or sometimes even a minor loss due to the grazing activities. While here we can see uh, an increase from about 4.7% to 7.6% from the early 19th century to 1860. Uh, it's often said that the earliest woodland coverage in, uh, in Scotland would be in early 19th with about 6% uh, of woodland cover. Uh, in the study area we see a minimum at least 1750. Of course I cannot go back to, uh, to before 1750 with a woodland cover that will be 2.5% after ruling out all the plantations. It is a minimum estimate because a lot of these plantations are not uh, identified as such on historical maps, and I can see that because uh, some maps from the 19th century uh, show woodlands that were not here in the 18th century, but it's not specified they are plantations. So it's, every time I talk about plantation, it's a minimum estimate because it's when it was acknowledged as such by, um, by the surveyors, but they didn't always uh, mention when it was a plantation. Um, half of the woodland cover would have been semi-natural by 1860. You saw earlier that in the study area it was clearly not the case. Uh, an upper estimate will say about 25% of, uh, of the woodland uh, as being semi-natural by, uh, by 1860. Semi-natural, so mostly composed of native species, uh, native tree species. Um, I'm not going to spend too much time on this, but it's another application of using historical estate maps based on this reconstruction. We can try to uh, characterize uh, the woodland distribution in the past using models, uh, use the logistic regression, because at the time of my PhD, it was still very commonly used, but now there are actually more advanced tools. Uh, just to see what type of variables actually will increase or decrease the likelihood of an area to be wooded in the uh, 19th century or in the 18th century. So for instance, if we take John Lanning estates, we see that the woodlands, the highest the elevation, the lowest uh, li likely uh, wood, uh, the area to be wooded. Uh, the slope was an important factor, so uh, woodlands were mostly on steep slopes uh, in the drumland rig estates. The soil was also uh, identified as significant factors, and the distance to the stream, because most of these woodlands were located along the streams uh, at that time period. I did the same work also to characterize the changes as the plantations in the 19th century. Uh, it's just for you to have a, an idea of an, how, you can, how far you can push, basically, based on this uh, woodland cover reconstruction. So now I'm going to discuss about ancient woodlands. Uh, I know it's a subject of interest for many of you uh, here. Uh, there is an ancient woodland inventory of Scotland, and uh, one of the main sources for this inventory is the Royal Military Survey of Scotland. And we defined ancient woodland in Scotland as an area that has been continuously wooded since at least 1750. And uh, identifying this ancient woodlands is uh, in Europe, uh, in the UK, everywhere important because these areas are recognized as having a particular biodiversity, a particular ecological value, and cultural value uh, also. So that's why a lot of countries have an ancient woodland uh, inventory. Uh, of course, the problem with the Roy map is that uh, there are questions about the accuracy of the, of the map, particularly the depiction of the woodland for the ancient woodland inventory, how reliable it is also, and the Roy maps, contrary to uh, estate maps, are not easily georeferenceable. It's uh, 
not uh, possible to overlay very well and or a map on the on the modern map. Uh, by extension, with this uh, we uncover reconstructions, we can actually uh, assess the potential of our map to identify ancient woodlands. And uh, here I took uh, some examples where I compare the woodland cover reconstructions with the uh, depiction of the right map. I am not sure that you can actually see this uh, very well, so you will have to believe me. Uh, on the right map, along the river, you have like a thick band of woodlands, while on this woodland cover reconstruction, we actually have some kind of patchy, more restricted uh, woodland cover. Uh, this is basically everywhere in the study area, where roads show very thick land of woodlands everywhere. Uh, while it's actually, it was much more patchy in 1772, so it's uh, 20, uh, a bit less than 20 years uh, after the Roy map. But we also have some estate plans from 1740 by, uh, by Vernon that shows that there are not more woodlands in 1740 than there were in uh, 1772. So what we can see from this comparison is that actually in my study area, the Roy map tend to uh, exaggerate the woodland cover. Uh, because it doesn't show the boundaries with the same, uh, same accuracy. Uh, if I take another example here, it's a uh, Koshoyal wood, which is a triple SI and uh, an ancient woodland today. The Roy's map shows woodland on both sides of the rivers. Uh, the two estate maps covering this area in the 18th century show that there were no, uh, no woodlands in the south uh, part of, uh, of the Burns. Uh, we also, if we do this comparison between the Roy's map and the estate maps, Sometimes we have very strong discrepancy. For instance, this, uh, this plantation here doesn't seem to look uh, anything close to what we have in this map that was made uh, six or seven years after uh, the Royal Military Survey of Scotland. So there are indeed questions about uh, the accuracy of the Royal Map and also about the reliability uh, on certain areas. So I told you earlier that the observation is a study area slightly different than what we can uh, often say about uh, woodland cover changes in Scotland in general. Uh, it is often said that the Roy's map overlook half of the woodland cover, uh, while in the study area, actually, it seems to completely overestimate the woodland cover, uh, in part due to the smaller scale of, uh, of the survey. Um, we often read also that the first OS maps can overlook uh, ancient woodland sites, and that the ancient woodland inventory is not, uh, is, uh, is missing a lot of woodland site because of this. If I look at the woodland cover reconstruction, I will see that only 3% of the true ancient woodlands in the study area were not on the first OS map, so it's a very small percentage. And this 3% actually can be explained by the accuracy, uh, difference of accuracy between estate maps, so it doesn't mean much. But what I just want to show here is that this assumption here doesn't apply in the study area, or if it applies, it's very minimal. Um, other estimates, so I didn't mention earlier, but the estimates I have about uh, woodland cover in the 18th century, 19th century, uh, are close to those by uh, someone called Sinclair, who published this in 1814. But the estimate by Sinclair was often dismissed because people say that it overlooked uncommercial woodlands, which is uh, an interesting point. So the question is, what do I consider as woodland in the study uh, that I've done for my, uh, my PhD? So I really define woodland as a broad definition. So I integrated open woodlands, I integrated uh, bushes, uh, bushy pasture, everything was uh, integrated as woodland when I did my reconstruction. I think it's important to define how you, you, um, you consider the woodland if you do this type of work. So I really took woodland as a very broad term. Uh, there are some other examples. Uh, Chris already mentioned some of them, this uh, stop wood, wood and cross. So all this was integrated in the GIS. And with the GIS possibility, it's possible for each polygons, each area is identified as woodland, to, to tag a label saying, okay, it was recognized by uh, Lewis in 1814 as wood and crogs, or as top wood, which will probably be a pollard, uh, or pasture with bushes. So this information is also in the database that uh, I, I created based on these uh, estate maps. So the implication about the ancient wooden inventory is that in the study area, about 40 to 50% of the area considered as ancient woodlands was actually not weeded before the 19th century. I don't have any sharp number, it's between 40 and 50% because I, when I did this assessment, I took into account the potential inaccuracy of the estate maps. So I'm not going to the GIS details, but uh, it's basically an order of magnitude. 
uh, rather than just a sharp number. This is likely to be an underestimate, of course, because the estate maps are post-1750. And they, as I mentioned earlier, they do not always indicate uh, plantations. So the uh, ancient woodland inventory, uh, there are two, two categories. Uh, I think it was implemented in the 1990s, but uh, I know that we have a presentation this afternoon uh, about, uh, about the ancient woodland inventory, so we may have the occasion to be a bit more into the detail. But uh, category 1A are the woodlands uh, identified from the Roy's map. For those uh, woodlands, the inaccuracy can reach 35, 40%. And category 2A uh, are woodlands, ancient woodlands identified from the first urnland survey based on the assumptions that the Roy's map overlooked this woodland. So we only, in that case, used the first urnland survey to identify those woods. Uh, and the inaccuracy here can reach uh, about 60%. So about 60% of the area that is in the ancient woodland inventory uh, was actually 19th century plantation. I put just one example here of uh, an ancient wood uh, overlay on the, on the farm of uh, Mainz by Leslie, where uh, we can see that it was mostly hilly there and uh, arable land there and there. Uh, I mentioned earlier about this, um, this regression model that uh, I tried. I don't think it's any good to reconstruct the wooden cover as it was in the 18th century, for instance, uh, because of course it's not only a matter of environmental variables, but it's also, it also a lot of historical reasons that will explain why a woodland is here or not. Uh, industry, uh, a, a lot of things that are difficult to, to model, particularly for uh, times like uh, 19th century. So for the woodland cover reconstruction, I don't think it's, uh, it's, this model are very helpful. However, after uh, creating this uh, probability maps, so there are probability of an area to be weeded in the 18th century. In blue, there are areas where you are very unlikely to identify woodlands. In red, are areas where you are more likely to find woodlands. And uh, what I did is I uh, overlaid the ancient woodland inventory on this model, and I could see that more than uh, randomly, it was possible to identify the pseudo ancient woodlands. So, areas considered as ancient woodland in the inventory, but we are not ancient woodland. This type of model can actually help to spot them uh, more than uh, randomly. So it's, it can be an application of this type uh, of, uh, of, uh, of mathematical models. Um, I cannot conclude that what I found in Isdale and Annandale uh, can, be, uh, can apply everywhere else in Scotland. But I think I try to show that some assumptions behind this woodland cover changes over time. They, are not, uh, they do not apply in uh, Nisdale and Annandale, so it's likely that they do also not apply uh, in other parts of Scotland. To what extent? I don't know, I cannot uh, conclude on this. Uh, but I wanted to point towards this, uh, this book by Barnes and Williamson in uh, Norfolk. Uh, so different, uh, of course, history, but uh, the findings of my PhD are very close to what they wrote in their book. They found out that about 25% of the uh, ancient woodlands in uh, Norfolk were actually not ancient woodlands, but uh, 19th century plantations. Uh, they also found, but we discussed this this afternoon, that a lot of indicators, species of ancient woodlands were found in these very modern woodlands. Uh, so again, that's to show that uh, I think everywhere we are more and more research that are uh, coming to this type of, uh, of conclusions, is that it's probably not an isolated uh, uh, case study. And that's it for now. <laughs>